Okay, let's get started. <clears throat> um, I was going to say something. Brain just went blank. Uh, I just posted a quiz. I haven't looked at the take that back. I've graded. I don't remember how many. Um, six or seven or eight, something like that, of the extra credit quizzes um, that were due last night at eleven fifty nine. I'll do the rest of those today. I put up the next quiz. I said I would do it on Wednesday. <laughs> I didn't, obviously. I think I said I would do it on Wednesday. Um, put up the next quiz this morning. It's due Tuesday at 11.59. It has 20 questions. It's multiple choice. 20 questions and 10 extra credit. And you have, I believe, a total of 20 minutes. To do it since it's multiple choice i mean if it were filling the blank you maybe have a little bit longer um and it's over terms for fiction again some of them might be the same terms that were in the um, extra credit quiz i honestly don't remember and then it also covers hawthorne's minister's black veil and faulkner's barn burning okay characters plot you know that kind of stuff so i want to pick up um, I want to do Faulkner today so that we can start on, not Monday, Monday's Labor Day, so we don't have class, on Wednesday of next week and do Flannery O'Connor. So we're one day behind. Um, Barn Burning, just a little bit of background. You've got a, a brief introduction to Faulkner. It's not very good because it's too incomplete. Um, more pictures in it is anything else. Um, Faulkner won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1950, and he didn't win it because he had just written, you know, the great American novel. He wrote it because of the series of novels he'd written since about the late 19 teens up through the 1930s. Um, Hawthorne wrote novels, he also wrote some short stories. Uh, he tried his hand at screenwriting in Hollywood. He thought he'd make it big. Um, he didn't. Wrote a uh, novel that was turned into a film. I think this is the right one. Intruder in the Dust. Um, he really wanted to write or tried to write what are called pot boilers. And those are, you know, kinds of novels that have a lot of extreme things. They're paid. Today we would call them page turners, the kind you know, you just can't put your hands down. Um, Southern fiction, as we will see also with, with Flannery O'Connor, they're both writing Southern fiction. And that means a couple of things. One, location, they're placed in the South. The setting for just about everything, Faulkner and, and uh, Faulkner and O'Connor, right, is set in the South. For Faulkner, it's set in largely in Mississippi, and often, not entirely, but often in a county he makes up, Yakna Patafa. Right? And that county has certain important families in it. One of those is the Snopes family. It's not this family. It's the general Snopes family, of which this is part. This is a branch, okay? Um, and the other one is Colonel Sartoris. And I can't remember his last name. The famous colonel in the Civil War on the part of the South, okay? Um, Snopes and I can't remember that name. Anyways, <clears throat> a lot of Southern fiction also has elements of the, the grotesque. Sometimes the grotesque are literally misshapen people, physically misshapen, but often they are psychologically misshapen. 
There's something internally wrong, okay? Um, and so, you know, sometimes it's a result of inbreeding. Sometimes it's, you know, it's emotional scars, PTSD kind of a thing. And I think it'll be pretty clear as we read that kind of describes Abner. There's, there's a screw missing upstairs, okay? Um, <laughs> in Faulkner's works, I won't say this about O'Connor's, in Faulkner's works, and this isn't necessarily part of, of Southern fiction, family, or as Abner will put it in this novel, bearing this short story, the pool of blood looms large. That is, sticking with one's family is really important. Or feeling that one must stick with one's family, and yet internally also feeling that one's family is screwed up and one must break out of it. One must break those bonds. Okay? We're going to see that in this short story. So notice how this begins. And also notice in that first paragraph, the first sentence ends in the first line, and then the second sentence begins, the boy, and doesn't end until you get to the old fierce pull of blood, period. The one sentence is the majority of the paragraph. That is characteristic of Faulkner's style. Long, this is on page 406 in the 11th edition, and probably 476. Is it barn burning? Yes. Yeah. In the 10th edition. Okay. The store in which the justice of the peace's court was sitting, in which the just sorry, in which the justice of the peace's court was sitting, smelled of cheese. Okay. So notice the court is meeting not in a courthouse. It's in a general store. Okay. The boy, crouched on his nail keg at the back of the crowded room, knew he smelled cheese and more. Notice, he knows intellectually. Now, does that mean he literally smells cheese? Or that is this something going on in his mind that he ought to smell cheese? Okay. Just hold that thought. Knew he smelled cheese and more. From where he sat, he could see the ranked shelves, close packed, with the solid squat dynamic shapes of tin cans whose labels his stomach read, not from the lettering, which meant nothing to his mind, but from the scarlet devils and the silver curve of fish. This, the cheese which he knew he smelled, and the hermetic meat which his intestines believed he smelled, coming in intermittent gusts, momentary and brief, between the other constant one. That is, this other constant smell, so to speak. The smell and sense just a little of fear because mostly of despair and grief, the old fierce pull of blood. Now, the old fierce pull of blood, is that a literal smell? No, it's not. This is figurative. Why does the boy, why do the boy's intestines think he smells meat? Hungry. Louder? He's hungry. He's hungry. He's sitting there in his general store and he's looking to his left or to his right or maybe up behind and he sees these shelves packed full of canned goods. Right? Notice, he can't read the labels. He's illiterate. But he sees the images of fish and other images on the labels. And because the images are of fish and maybe chicken 
or turkey or other kinds of meat. His stomach growls. He sees that and his stomach growls. He can't read it. So the juxtaposition between the hunger that he has, literal hunger, okay, and this other thing that's pulling him. Hunger pulls you, right? I mean, it draws you to food if you're hungry enough. So he's hungry, but something else is pulling him at the same time. We're not told why he has this little bit of fear, mostly of despair and grief, but an other one, the old fierce pull of blood. We're not told right now, just yet, why there is this fierce pull of blood. He could not see the table where the justice sat, and before which his father and his father's enemy, parentheses, italics, our enemy. What has the narrator just done? What's the our enemy? And? His own. Because his father has an enemy, notice what the boy does. I have an enemy too. If this person sitting up there opposite, you know, his father is his father's enemy, then he's my enemy also. Okay? The old fierce pull of blood, that's what that's getting at. He thought in that despair. Editorial omniscience. So we're, we're being told, at the very least, this narrator, okay, is limited omniscient because we're seeing inside this boy's mind at this point. We don't know if it's uh, objective, uh, unlimited omniscient, if, if we're going to see in other people's minds, okay? So, our, mine, his and both. He's my father. Notice, the reason this other person is his enemy is because he's the enemy of his father. Gotta stand with dead. But he could hear them. So he can't see his father and his father's enemy. He can hear their voices. The two of them, that is, because his father had said no word yet. So his father's been silent. But his father's enemy has spoken. And who else has? Apparently the justice of the peace. But what proof have you, Mr. Harris? That's the justice of the peace speaking. I told you. And so now Mr. Harris, who's his father's enemy, according to the boy, I told you the hog got in my corn. I caught it up, sent it back to him. He had no fence. It would hold it. I told him. So warned him. So the father's hog gets loose, gets into this other guy's cornfield, catches the hog, ties him up, takes him back, told him to fence it up. Next time I put the hog in my pen. <laughs> it's kind of like finders keepers. When he came to get it, I gave him wire to patch it up. What, what does it mean, wire to patch it up? Louder? Heard somebody. He gave him fence wire to fix his own fence. Is this the action of an enemy? No. What did Mr. Harris show the boy's father? Because notice we don't have any names yet other than Mr. Harris. He showed some compassion. He showed some mercy. What could he have done? He could have just slaughtered that hog. You know, and cured the meat and eat it. So, he says, next time, I put the hog up and kept it. And so, what does the father do? He sends a former slave to get it. Right? Where is he? Where's the guy he sent? I don't know. That's not proof. Why isn't it proof? 
What, what would this be called in a court of law? Hearsay. You're telling me what somebody else said. The justice of peace is saying, I want to hear it from his mouth. I want to hear what the messenger you know, said. And so Mr. Harris says, get that boy up here. Talking about the boy sitting in the back of the room who doesn't see anything that's going on, but is listening to it. He knows. And for a moment, the boy thought, too, that the man meant his older brother. Until Harris said, not him. The younger one. The little one. The boy. And crouching, small for his age, small and wiry like his father, in patched and faded jeans, even too small for him. Why? Patched? Louder? Hand me downs? Faded? They're old? They're worn out? And they're even too small? He's outgrown them. But they're all he has. So, what does this tell us about the family's financial position, let's say? They're poor. Okay. And we're going to be told, you know, what kind of job his father has. They're sharecroppers. So, the people part, the boy goes up. And the boy thinks at the end of that paragraph, paragraph 7, he aims for me to lie. Who's the he? His dad. His father. He wants me to lie, he thought. Again, with that frantic grief and despair. What are you if you are frantic? You know, you're all nervous, jittery. The grief and despair, I mean, they are what for this boy? Just below the surface. We would say he's got a short fuse. Not in the sense that he's going to erupt and kill. He's got a short fuse in that he is going to erupt. I mean, he's doing everything just to keep it bottled. And I will have to do hit. Hit. Little bit of dialect thrown in. Why? Because it shows, or, you know, low class, poor diction to show not educated. What's your name, boy? The Justice of Peace asked. Colonel Sartorius Snopes. The boy whispers. Eh, Bika, talk loud. Colonel Sartorius? I reckon anybody named Colonel Sartorius in this country can't help but tell the truth, can they? If you're named after Colonel Sartorius, okay, this is in a society, in a county, where this guy is revered. It would be like, you know, in, say the, say this was happening in 1950, and the boy, or it's 1955, and the boy is 10 years old, and he says, you know, what's your name, boy? And he says, General Ike, Eisenhower, or General Eisenhower Snopes, and he goes, well, you know, because why would, I, why use Eisenhower? Because he led the Allies, he led the United States troops in World War II. And everybody respected him. They might not have agreed with him politically, you know, Democrats didn't, but they still respected him, okay? He said, what a name. I reckon anybody with that name can't help but tell the truth, right? Boy, he doesn't say anything. He doesn't say, yes, sir, I'll tell the truth. He just thinks, and that's why it's in italics, enemy. In so now it's not just Mr. Harris that's the enemy. The justice of the peace is the enemy. For a moment, he could not even see. He could not see that the justice's face was kindly, nor discerned that his voice was troubled. Why can't he see this? It's not, he can't physically see the justice of the peace's face. 
Because he doesn't want to? Possible that he doesn't want to. Why? Enemy. Why else? The frantic grief and despair. We would say he's kind of blinded by what? What phrase comes next? Often. Hatred. <clears throat> hatred. He's blind to what is there because his hatred doesn't allow him. To even see it. And so the justice of the peace turns to Harris. Do you want me to question this boy? Why? Why does he ask that question? What is this telling us about the justice of the peace? Do you think any judge wants to put a 10 year old boy on the witness stand? To testify against his father. No. No. Nobody would want to do that. Because that's, you know, that's breaking one of those bonds. But the boy could hear, and during those subsequent long seconds, while there was absolutely no sound in the crowded little room, save that of quiet and intent breathing, it was as if he had swung outward at the end of a grapevine over a ravine, over a ravine, and at the top of the swing had been caught in a prolonged instant of mesmerized gravity, weightless in time. So, notice the image. It's like he's on a grapevine, notice, not a rope, because <laughs> he doesn't have rope, can't afford rope, swinging over a ravine, and there's probably like a creek down below, and it's when he reaches the highest point of the swing and freezes. In other words, he's hanging over an abyss. Everything depends on what happens next. No, says Harris. Damnation. Send him out of here. I'm not going to make that little boy squirm. He doesn't say that, but that's implied. What Again, what does this show us about Harris? He's kind. He's already tried more than once to help the boy's father. And the boy's father repays that how? He doesn't. Do we know why they're having this court, having the trial of sorts? Not yet. We haven't found out what the crime is. It's, it's not just the hawk. This case is closed. I can't find against you. Oh, we finally get a name. Snopes. But I can't give you advice. Leave this county. Don't come back. Can he legally require him? No, he can't. Judges can't do that. Police can't do that. Feds can't do that. They can't say, leave, or you're going to be arrested. And his father speaks for the first time. His voice, cold and harsh. That's editorial comment. Okay? So the narrator is telling us kind of what to think about this character. His voice cold and harsh, level without emphasis. That is, he doesn't raise his intonation, he doesn't lower his voice, it's just flat. I aim to. I don't figure to stay in the country among people who do. He said something unprintable and vile. Addressed to no one. Okay, he says it, but we're told it's addressed to no one. He doesn't say, in a country among people like Mr. Harrison, this justice of the peace, who? Who's it really addressed to? Everyone. You're all pieces of. That's kind of what he's getting at. That'll do. Take your wagon and get out of this country before dark. Case dismissed. His father turned and he followed the stiff black coat. The boy does. The wiry figure walking a little stiffly from where a Confederate provost man's musket ball had taken him in the heel on a stolen horse 30 years ago. So, 
30 years ago, the Confederate man's musket ball is referring to probably during the Civil War, that was 30 years ago, so at the very earliest, this is 1891. It's probably sometime between 1891 and 1895. Okay. And what was he doing when he got shot in the heel? Anybody know what kind of crime that was in the 19th century? Punishable by death. And it didn't have to be death coming from a judge. If you caught someone stealing your horse, boom, you could kill him. Okay? And it's interesting, he gets struck on the heel. You know, there's a reason we call that tendon that goes from the heel to the calf muscle the Achilles heel, and it goes back to ancient Greek mythology. That's the only part that didn't get dipped in the river Styx by his mother. That's what she held him by. And according to Greek myth, the only way you could kill Achilles was to wound him in the heel. That ultimately is how he dies. Right? So it's indicating weakness. Followed the two backs now. Since his older brother had appeared from somewhere in the crowd, no taller than the father, but thicker. Chewing tobacco steadily between the two lines of grim faced men. So it's almost like they're walking the gauntlet. The brother in front, the father, then the little boy. And they go down into the among the dogs and half grown boys in the mild May dust. So we're told the time of year. So the setting, the location, it's in the south. We're not told exactly where, but it's in the south. It's safe to assume it's Mississippi, as I said, because it's Faulkner. We know the time of year, May, late spring, planting season, okay, where as he passed, that is, as the boy passed, somebody hissed, bar, burner. Ah, there's the crime. Somebody's barn burned down. Again, he could not see whirling. What is the whirling, that present participle verb, modify? It modifies the subject. That's he. That's the boy. Why can't the boy see? Because he is spinning so fast. Why is he spinning? <laughs> Whoever said that is going to get punched. There is a face in a red haze, moonlight bigger than the full moon, the owner of it half again his size. The person who said, barn burner, is half the size of the boy. Right? Take, uh, sorry, take that back. Half size bigger than the boy. Misread that. He's striking out at somebody probably more like 12, 15 years old, who's grown a bit taller than him, possibly even older than him. He, leaping in the red haze toward the face, it's red because of the dust, because of the dirt that's been kicked up. Feeling no blow, feeling no shock when his head struck the earth. That's telling us the kid gets dead. Colonel Sartoris, scrabbling up and leaping again. So he gets knocked down. You know, he's like uh, Steve Rogers. You just keep punching him. He gets knocked down and he goes back. To see the other boy in full flight, himself already leaping into pursuit as his father's hand jerked him back. Again, the harsh, cold voice. His voice will never change. Really. I mean, he's just pretty much harsh and cold. Go get in the wagon. And so we're told where the wagon is, and we're told who's in the wagon. His two hulking sisters. Okay, so hulking, that means they're not what? They're not small, they're not dainty. These are 
big girls, okay, in their Sunday dresses, and his mother and her sister in calico and sunbonnets were already in it. Why are they already all in the wagon? Is it just because they came for the court? They came for the trial, but they didn't go inside. They sat outside. Is this a, you know, no women allowed kind of a thing? Nope. What do they already know? They're going to be moving. How do we know? Because everything is packed in the wagon. Look at what we're told. Sitting on or among the sorry residue of the dozen and more movings, which even the boy could remember. So the boy can re remember. They've had to move at least 12 times. He's 10 years old, we're going to be told. It's more than one a year. Okay. Why? Why have they had to move so much? The battered stove, the broken beds and chairs, the clock inlaid with mother of pearl, which would not run. That is, the clock doesn't work. It's ultimately trash, but it looks pretty. Stopped at some 14 minutes past 2 o'clock of a dead and forgotten day and time which had been his mother's dowry. That's what she brought to the wedding. She was crying, though when she saw him, she drew her sleeve across her face, began to descend from the wagon. She does what? She take, go ahead. She takes a look at her youngest son, who's been beaten up, and she wants to get down out of the wagon to help him. And her husband says, get back. He's hurt. I gotta get some water. Get back in the wagon. He got in too over the tailgate. The boy does. His father mounted to the seat where the older brother already sat, struck the gaunt mules. Notice the mules are thin. Why? Because they're hungry also. The family doesn't have enough to feed itself or their mules. And the brother struck the mules with two savage blows. Uh, the father did, but without heat. Now we're going to see that phrase, without heat, a couple of times. What does it mean? The father's going to hit the boy. But we're told it's without heat. Yeah, kind of. Okay. It's... Without emotion is a good way of putting it. Without passion. I mean, he's not he's not letting all of his frustration out, you know, smacking that kid. And we're gonna be told why. He channels that passion, that anger, in a particular way. Okay. So the wagon goes on, they go past the store, and the boy thinks forever. Maybe he's done satisfied now. Now that he has. That is, maybe he's got out of his system. Now that he's, what? Burned a barn? The mother. Does it hurt? No. Nah. It don't hurt. Let me be. Can't you wipe some of the blood off before your eyes? I'll wash tonight. Let me be, I tell you. He says to her, okay, wagon goes on and on. He doesn't know where they're going. None of them ever did or ever asked. Because there was always somewhere, always a house of sorts waiting. Notice, a house of sorts. Now, what can literally be a house of sorts? Anything. Four walls and a roof. And maybe four kind of walls with holes in them. Not windows, holes. Likely his father had already arranged to make a crop on another farm before he... Why doesn't the boy tell himself, think in his own mind, what it is his father does? Before he what? Okay, what are we being told? 
The Father already knows we're going to have to move again. He's already lined up new work. That is, he's lined up a new patch of ground that he will share crop on before he even does what? Burns the barn. Tells us this is premeditated, right? I mean, this isn't spur of the moment. This isn't, ooh, wow, you know, and this is, okay, I'm going to burn the barn, but before I do, I've got to make sure we have somewhere else to go to, okay? There was something, this is one of the most famous lines in Faulkner. There was something about his wolf-like independence and even courage when the advantage was at least neutral, which impressed strangers. Let's pause there. Are wolves independent creatures? No. no, they are not. They are pack animals. What phrase do we get? What term do we use for a wolf that goes off on its own? How do we use that today? When certain things happen in our society. Uh, it's used for like, um, like things that make people choose their relationship. Bingo. That phrase is always used to describe school shooters, school shooters, mass shootings, because they almost always happen with one person. The kid in Charlottesville several years ago went into the black church. He was a lone wolf, you know. The kid in Parkland, South Florida, the school, a lone wolf, okay. Um, the guy in Uvalde, Texas, the one a couple weeks after that up in Ohio or Pennsylvania, the synagogue shooter a couple of years ago. They were all lone wolves. Little tidbit, by the way. Every one of those, the FBI knew ahead of time. There had been warnings. The police had warnings. The so-called red flags were flashing, and nothing was done. Okay? Notice his wolf-like independence. It did what? It impressed strangers. But only in certain situations when the advantage was at least neutral. If the advantage is neutral, then it's not an advantage, right? It's a level playing field. Okay? But this is the boy thinking this. As if they got those strangers watching this from outside as if they got from his latent, ravening ferocity, not so much a sense of dependability as a feeling that his ferocious conviction and the rightness of his own actions would be of advantage to all whose interest lay with his. So his latent, ravening ferocity. Ravening ferocity, pretty clear, right? Ravening, wolf-like, ferociousness, okay? But it's latent. What is something that is latent? Surprise. When it's revealed, you're surprised. It's just beneath the surface. I said surprise. Oh, surprise. Thank you. Yeah. It's just beneath the surface. What does it take to bring that out? And pretty much nothing. You look at somebody wrong. I mean, we've got a, a lot of this latent ferocity in our society right now. We're, we're, you know, we're at the boiling point, folks. It's dangerous because it doesn't take much to set people off. So we're told he has this, and we're told it's as if these strangers see all this and they get from him not so much a sense of dependability, that is, you can depend on this guy to act a certain way every time and all the time. No, not that. As much as a feeling that his ferocious conviction in the rightness of his own actions. Now, 
How many of you, when you do something, I mean do something, not think something, not say something, but you do something, think that what you're doing is right? Usually, yes. I mean, yeah, there would be the odd time when you know you shouldn't do something and you do it anyways. I mean, something that you believe to be a good. That's what this is talking about. Okay? But notice, it is a ferocious convention in the rightness of his own actions. What are the actions, though? Yeah. As if they would get from that, what? An advantage to all those whose interest lay with his. It's like, oh, if we could get him on our side, <clears throat> what would happen to our side? We would then have the advantage. Okay? So they can't. Notice, it, they're not getting to where they're going to be living in that one day. They can't. It's cold at night. They had a small fire. Neat, that is arranged. Niggard, almost. What does N-I-G-G-A-R-D mean? It's the opposite of luxurious. It's the opposite of generous. It's the opposite of extravagant. So what's the op what is what are the opposites of all those words? Small, cheap, thrifty, stingy, greedy. <laughs> okay. What's the fire that's being talked about used for? To keep them warm. To keep them warm. If you're camping at night, freezing weather, don't you want a big fire? One that keeps you warm? What, what is the source of the wood? Are they packing the wood with them, carrying it from one place to another? No, he takes a part of the fence. It burns the post for the fence. It doesn't belong to him. So why not have a big, rip-roaring fire? Because fire represents something. You don't just waste fire to Abner Snopes, okay? Older, this is the narrator telling us, the boy might have remarked this, that is, the boy might have thought about this and wondered why not a big one? Why should not a man who had not really seen the waste and extravagance of the war, civil war, but who had in his blood an inherent voracious prodigality with material not his own? Notice, an inherent, born in him, voracious, cannot be satisfied, prodigality, liberalness, gener uh, generousness, wastefulness, okay, with material not his own, got by thieving. Why would he not have burned everything inside? This is the narrator telling us if the boy were older, he would be capable of having this kind of thought. Then, <laughs> older, he might have gone a step farther and thought, well, that's the reason. That niggard, that small, chintzy, little, cheap, flimsy almost, blaze was the living fruit of nights passed during those four years in the woods. 1861 to 1865, the Civil War, hiding from all men, blue or gray. See, Abner wasn't a Confederate soldier. He wasn't a Union soldier. He was what? Slave. No. It's a good guess. No. Snopes family's white. Sharecroppers. Yep, they're sharecroppers. Yes, but why? Think about why he gets shot in the heel. Because he's a horse thief. He's thieving from both sides. I mean, this guy's lowest of the low. Okay? With his strings of horses, 
Notice, he doesn't steal just one. If he can find a horse from a Confederate camp, he'll steal it. If he can find a horse from a Union camp, he'll steal it. Okay? Captured horses, he called them. And older still, he might have divined the true reason. Divine. That is, like, God would have inspired the idea into his mind. Why doesn't he build big fires to keep the family warm? The element of fire spoke to some deep mainspring of his father's being, as the element of steel or powder spoke to other men. Steel, swords, powder, gunshot. What's he talking about? A little bit more specifically, the way to strike out at your enemy. You can kill him with a sword or a knife. You can kill him with a gun. Or you can kill him with fire. Fire is his chosen weapon. Okay. As the one weapon for the preservation of integrity, else breath were not worth the breathing and hence to be regarded with respect. That is, therefore, you use fire with respect and discretion. If you don't need a big fire to warm your family, don't have one. Why? Because fire is his method of striking out. Okay? But the boy doesn't know this now. And he's only seen these little, teeny, tiny, small fires all his lifetime. It's kind of telling us that in the winter months, the boy is never what? Warm. Warm. Okay? He eats his supper. And his father comes up to him, calls him over to him, and he goes, and we're told, the voice was like tin and without heat like tin. You were fixing to tell them. You would have told them. He didn't answer. The boy doesn't answer. And his father, on the side of his head. Doesn't necessarily mean across the face. Could just be whack. Upside the head, you know. Again, without heat. Exactly as he had struck the two mules. Exactly as he would strike either of them with any stick in order to kill a horse fly. You're getting to be a man. You got to learn. You got to learn to stick to your own blood or you ain't going to have any blood to stick to you. Do you think either of them, any man there this morning, would? That is... Do you think any of the men in that courtroom would have stuck with you? What did we see? The justice of the peace did, and Mr. Harris did. Why? Because they didn't question him. You were going to tell the truth. No, he didn't, because he was never actually questioned. Don't you know all they wanted was a chance to get at me because they knew I had them beat. What does Abner think about what happened? That he won. I won. I beat them. And yet Mr. Harris is still sitting fat, dumb, and happy in his house. And Abner's got to take his family off to a new shack. Okay? If I had said they wanted only truth justice, he would have hit me again. But now, and notice, the boy thinks that, or the, excuse me, we're, we're told the boy tells himself that 20 years later. That's the narrator telling us, no matter whatever else happens in the story, the boy is a lie 20 years later. Answer me, Daddy, you were going to tell him, weren't you? Yes, Get on to bed. We'll be there tomorrow. So they arrive, and it's a shack. Right? They get unpacked, and the boy goes with his father to his new master's home. I don't mean master like master-slave relationship. I mean master, the person who owns all the property that he is now sharecropping part of. You know, when you sharecrop, let's say the person owns 400 acres. 
plot of land, 20 acres by 20 acres. Well, the sharecropper farms, works all this land, but part of it, the sharecropper gets to keep for himself. The, the amount of produce that's grown on that plot is his own, all right? But he has to produce a certain amount from the rest of this. If he doesn't get it from this, let's say he's got to produce 100 bushels from this. If he gets 95, then he's got to pull five bushels out of his own crop to reach that magical number of 100, okay? So he goes up to the house. The guy owns the property, whose name is Major Despain. And we get the central complication of this story. Right? And notice the description on page 409. So they get to the property and they go down this long avenue lined by these massive trees. And then the boy sees the house. And it's like nothing he has ever seen before. Big white columns. Turn for a moment on to page 405 where you see Faulkner's home. Okay? Lined with trees and then the big white house. And look at what the boy thinks about two-thirds of the down on, down on page 409. He sees this and says, it's as big as a courthouse. They are safe from them. Why? His father's like a bug compared to this kind of wealth. He can't touch them. Okay? So, he goes up to the door. I'm not going to finish this. We'll get close enough. He goes up to the door, knocks on it, black servant answers. He says, Major to Spain isn't here, and Abner walks in. But what did he do before he got all the way up to the door? We're told in the middle of the walkway, there's a pile of horse droppings. And he walks, and because he walks with a limp, you know, he kind of drags the leg. And he can go around the horse droppings, but he doesn't. He steps right in the middle of it. On his good foot, I think it is. Okay? So now he's gone up to the door, knocks on it, servant opens, and Abner steps in, and there's this beautiful cream colored rug. Round, I think it is. And he goes in and he steps on that. And Mrs. Despain comes down, tells him to leave, and he turns. He's got his good leg like this, and he does this. And just smears horse dung in a semicircle on that rug. Obviously, does not please Major Despain. So, Major Despain comes to him with the rug and says, Clean it. How does Abner clean it? He gets a rock and he gets lye soap. <coughs> Lye is an acid, L-Y-E. It's really good for dissolving bodies. If you get it, you know, in powder form and put it in water. Read some, you know, crime throwers. People have been known how you dispose of a corpse. Okay? <clears throat> so he uses lye soap and a stone. How well does he clean it? He gets rid of the stain, but he burns, damages the... Um, Right. We'll stop there. We'll pick up there on Wednesday of next week. I've still got the quiz up. Okay. The quiz is still um, active. It's due Tuesday night. Uh, I'm not going to say anything that's going to make it easier or harder to take the quiz. It's, it's pretty much straight from the um, story. Okay. The quiz will be active at noon today. That's when you'll be able to access it. And you have until 11.59 Tuesday night. Thank you. Have a good weekend.